Good morning, church. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be worshiping with you this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us gather together and rejoice and be glad in it. No matter where you are this morning worshiping with us, know that God is truly with us and God is truly great. Let us take an opportunity and bow before him in a word of prayer. Father God, we are thankful for this time that we have set aside to worship you, to lift up our voices in praise, to humbly come before you in prayer this morning. We thank you for this privilege and this time together. We pray, Lord, that wherever we might be, that you keep us healthy, that you keep us safe in this time as we grow together as Christians, as your children. Give us peace. All glory and honor to you. Amen. Amen. And now, would you join us in singing, Thank You, Lord. and singing Let It Rise. Let it rise. 
join together in the affirmation of faith found in Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, no. in all no things, things we are more than, than conquerors, conquerors through the through one, one who loved us. us. We, we are, are sure that neither that death, death nor life nor angels nor, nor principalities nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we have children's time. Good morning, everyone. I bet you can guess what holiday we are going to talk about during children's time today. It's Thanksgiving, that'd be right. This Thursday is Thanksgiving. And I have some things here with me today that I am thankful for. My first one is this little guy right here. He's moving around. This is Kellen. And this is Patrick and I's little boy who was born in September and we are super thankful for him this year. And friends and family are usually the first things I hear when I ask somebody, what are you thankful for? I have some other things here I'm thankful for. Hmm, let's see, let's talk about this one first. I have an empty Sprite bottle here. Hmm, well, why would I be thankful for that? Kind of looks like it could be in my trash can or rolling around on my car floor or by the side of the road. Well, when I look at this bottle, I don't see an empty pop bottle. I see that I drank the Sprite. And you know what? I really like Sprite. I like pop. I got to have a treat. And so I look at this pop bottle and I remember that I got to drink some yummy Sprite. So my next thing is, oh, what about this? Hmm. This is a football, if you can't tell. This is a football and on Thanksgiving, I don't know about your families, but we would go out and we would throw a football around, kind of work off some of those sweet potatoes and pie, you know? But this one looks like it's seen better days. It's kind of ripped and, oh, it's kind of torn and, well, there's not much air in it, and I don't think it would go very far. But I'm thankful for it because when I look at it, I don't see a deflated football. I see a football that holds lots of memories because we got to go out and we got to throw it around and play some great games with this football. So I'm thankful for this football. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but this is my old coffee cup. Hmm, there's kind of a little bit of coffee in it and it's pretty sticky in there because I like lots of creamer. Hmm, this looks like it should be sitting maybe by my sink or in my sink. I should be getting ready to wash it. Hmm, maybe with all the other dishes I need to wash. Hmm. How would I be thankful for it? Well, this morning I got to drink my coffee and I got to talk to my mom and we had a good time. So I look at this coffee cup and I don't think, gosh, I need to wash my coffee cup. 
I think, man, I got to talk to my mom and have a great time this morning. So I'm thankful for my coffee cup, even though I need to wash it. And my last item is my face mask. Hmm. My face mask. You know, this year, your Thanksgiving might look kind of different. You might be wearing one of these. Or maybe there are some people who would usually be around your table that won't be around your table. Um, or maybe uh, you're not getting to go somewhere that you usually get to go on Thanksgiving. So it could be kind of a different year. It could be hard to be thankful. And our face masks are certainly something that um, you've probably worn a lot this year. And so I look at my face mask and I'm thankful because, you know, when we were um, doing church all together, we could do that because we were all wearing our face masks. And you are able to go to school this year, um, even though it's half a day for most of you, because you're wearing your face mask. And we can go out and about, and I might even get to do a little bit of Christmas shopping because I can wear a face mask. So our face masks keep us safe. And there's something we can be thankful for this year, even though it might be a little different, it might be a little strange, and we still may not be used to wearing them. I'm super thankful to have my face mask. You know, the Bible says, um, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, and that means if you're talking or um, you're playing football or you're drinking a bottle of pop or you're snuggling with a baby, whatever you do, to do it all in the name of Christ Jesus and to give thanks to him. And so this Thanksgiving, I want to challenge you to be thankful for the things that maybe you don't think about being thankful for. And maybe you could even play a little game with your family and you could scrounge up some things that you're thankful for and you could have somebody guess. So you could go get an item and you could say, mom, guess why I'm thankful for this? Or you could play it with your siblings too. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything you've given us. Help us this year to be especially thankful for each other and for all the blessings you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful children's message this morning. This morning, as you have uh, been aware, uh, Pastor Isaac is away this morning, and uh, we have the honor and privilege of having with us our district superintendent to uh, deliver the message this morning for us, uh, Reverend Mitch Reese. Well, greetings. My name is Mitch Reese, and I'm the Wichita East-West District Superintendent of the United Methodist Church. And it's a privilege for me to be able to come to you this morning in worship. Um, usually during this time of year, I'm meeting with area churches um, in what's called our charge conference season. It's when we come and we do worship together as area churches. We talk about the leadership who's being called into ministry, as well as talking about what kind of funding we're going to be used for missional engagement in a variety of ways. But this year, because of COVID, it has changed our dynamics. And those meetings are being held virtually, and so we're handling them in a far different way. But I still wanted the opportunity to be able to come to you, to be able to share a message with you in this worship service today. And so it is a great privilege for me to be with you and to be able to speak with you. And if you're not part of the Methodist family, I realize some of you may be joining via uh, the internet in a way that, and this is not your congregation or you're not maybe a United Methodist. Um, I hope this morning's word will encourage your hearts as we together try to grow in our faith. You know, the other thing I want to say quickly before we begin is how much I appreciate you and I appreciate our pastors. You all have worked and adapted in incredible ways over the last eight months. It's been powerful to watch the way when COVID hit that you moved into technology in some ways that maybe were unfamiliar to you. And if you did not have technology available to you, you figured out ways to get devotions and messages out to people in written form. And also the ways that you've figured out how to do ministry in new and creative ways. So I, I just want to affirm you and thank you for all of your work you're doing for Christ's kingdom. Well, today as we gather, um, the message I would like to share with you is around the idea of staying the course, discerning God's heart in a time of disruption. You know, we all find ourselves in this weird time, but I want to encourage us by saying, you know, this isn't new. 
If we look back over human history, we find that there have been previous pandemics, there have been world wars, there has been financial collapse, there have been political and spiritual divides. And you know, whenever those kind of times have happened across history, people respond in a variety of ways. I mean, it can stir up for some of us a sense of just being overwhelmed and it can unravel us. And for some, it can even destroy where there just feels like there's no hope. For others, it can convince us that if we could just get back to the way things were before, everything would be okay. And then there are those of us that are being challenged to adapt and adjust in new ways. And that really takes courage to move into a place that we've never been before. We're finding we're in that season Susan Beaumont in her book, Leading When You Don't Know Where You're Going, calls a liminal season. It's that season which you're... What you, we are where we are right now to where are we becoming and we're really not sure what that's going to look like, how we're going to get there and what's it going to look like when we finally do arrive. We don't know what it's going to look like financially. We don't know what the government's necessarily going to look like culturally or globally. Even spiritually is undefined. We don't know whether the church will find that more people have left the congregations and are not involved in Christianity, um, adding to the nuns and duns, or will we come out and there'll be a great awakening? We really don't know. All we know is that things are going to be different in some way. And we have to figure out how are we going to live into that and make sure that we're staying on course in the process. You know, when we look at what the goal is, of course, throughout Scripture, we know where we're heading. We know what the final destination is, and it's really to be with Christ. It's to be restored into that relationship with God, right? And so we know that we are becoming disciples. That means to follow Jesus. You know, we look at the world and we look at following Christ. You know, sometimes we can be out in front, right? We're saying, Jesus, come on. Or sometimes we think we're just side by side, but really to be a disciple means we're one step behind and we're keeping our eyes on Jesus and where is Jesus going? And if Jesus makes turns, are we following? Are we going in the position where he wants us to go? Are we adjusting course as we need to? And I think times like this could be part of that course adjustment. When I was in junior high, I played basketball. And um, I remember one time that I got the basketball and I saw a clearing and so I started to dribble down the court. As I went with my eyes focused on the basketball rim, I found that I was passing my teammates and I was passing the opposing team. And then as I went up for the layup, you know, I could hear the crowd yelling, but it wasn't until I was in the air, the ball had left my hand before I heard the words, You're going the wrong way. You see, I had my mind set on what I thought was the right course, and I was so focused on me, and I was so focused on my own direction, that I didn't see where the crowd was telling me I needed to alter course. And I think sometimes in our world, we find ourselves in that position. And this becomes a moment in time where I think we honestly need to step back individually and say, where are Possibly have we or our congregations lost focus on Christ? Have we possibly in some way? Is God wanting us to reshift? Have we shifted to basically we're using Christ to serve ourselves or promote us or our own will or agenda or our own church's agenda? And that's not uncommon. We find that believers throughout time have meant well, but have gotten off course, and we all need a course adjustment. In fact, if you look back in Scripture, you can see when Jesus was at one point heading up to Jerusalem to be crucified. I can't imagine all the things that were running through Jesus' mind, and he continued to do ministry, but he knew where he was heading, he knew where it was going to end. And a couple of his disciples come up to him and they say, Hey, Jesus! You know, when we get this kingdom thing worked out, could I sit on your right? And this guy here, he'd like to sit on your left. See, their minds were fixed on what was going to serve them. They thought they had their eyes on the right course. But Jesus says, you know, that's not for me to decide. In fact, I have other things I'm needing to focus on right now, and you as well. Or we can think of the Pharisees. I mean, you know, the Pharisees get a pretty bum rap. Um, we oftentimes see them in a negative way, but 
I have to be honest, as I get older, sometimes I feel like I'm more of a Pharisee than I would like to be. But really, the Pharisees, in their minds, really were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to protect the nation of Israel. And they thought if the people, the Jews, quit following the law, that God was going to come and remove them from the country. He was going to tear down their temple. And things were not going to go well. And so they were trying to protect that. But they were so blinded by what they thought was the right way that when God showed up in their midst in Christ, they didn't even see it. And we don't want to find ourselves in a similar position. So when God starts to move in our world in these uncommon times, in these times of disruption, is God trying to get our attention? And sometimes, whenever God's trying to get our attention, some things start to rise up in us. It could be a sense that this maybe is God trying to say something to us. Because when disruption happens, I find we may respond in a couple of ways. Some people we find, and I bet we can see these things happening around us in our world today, they begin to blame others for the disruption. You know, Jesus said we look at the splinter in our neighbor's eye and think, how is this causing what's going on? Or maybe we find as God's trying to alter our course, we're defending or protecting our self and our self-interest. You know, I think it's interesting, isn't it, when the COVID epidemic happened, what we did with toilet paper, right? How many of us ran out and tried to get as much as possible for us? Or we may find ourselves becoming defeated, that we just think, how am I ever going to be used, or what kind of difference can we really make in this mess? And other times, I think we find ourselves in a place where we're looking for shortcuts. We're looking for who's got it figured out. And you know, how many times have we in the church looked for what church is doing it and having success and then we go over and we ask them, how are they doing it? And then we try to copy it. But is that the course we're supposed to be taking? Is that where God is leading us? Or is that just the course God's leading them on? It doesn't mean we can't learn, but is it really where God is directing us? So I think sometimes all of these kind of distractions can keep us from going where God is wanting to move us now. So in the book of Hebrews... I want to use it this morning as kind of our guiding text to lead us to how we might stay on course in these particular times. In the early church, um, when Hebrews was being written, we find that those early believers were in a time when uh, the, the government was starting to press against Christianity. So there was some persecution starting to rise, but not only in the culture, but also in the church itself. Because during that time, it was primarily Jewish persons that were meeting in the synagogue, but people were believing in Christ and coming to faith. And so there was a group called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were people that were Jewish, that obeyed the law, that had come to believe in Christ. And when they believed in Christ, they were then filled with the Holy Spirit. And that became a sign that God had accepted them in a sense, and that Christ had truly entered them. And so they were marking that everyone who was really going to follow Christ had to follow the Jewish law, and then they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you didn't follow the law, then you were against God. You weren't doing it right. On the other hand, there were people that were following, um, that they believed that as long as you had faith in Christ, it didn't matter if you followed any of the law. And so there was this polarization that was happening within the life of the church. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 25, here's what this writer says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching." See, the writer of Hebrews knew what the destination ultimately was, and he was speaking to a group of people who knew the destination was really restored relationship with God. But they were struggling with how do we stay on that right course? What are the right steps we need to be taking to be in relationship and stay in relationship with God? And so in the text, I think there's a couple of things 
that are laid out to assist us in doing that well. First of all, he uses the image of the temple. And in the temple image, there is two parts. There was the Holy of Holies, and there was the holy place. Now, priests could come into the holy place, but they found that there was a curtain or a veil that separated them from the Holy of Holies. They couldn't go in to that place. And only the high priest could go in one time a year, had to make special sacrifices, and then they were able to enter. But you know, when we look in this text, we see that when Jesus came, Jesus, it says, when he died on the cross carrying our sin, our brokenness, when he died, we find in the scripture it says the temple curtain was rent from top to bottom. It opened up the way to the Holy of Holies. And so what I believe the writer of Hebrews is saying in staying the course is, first of all, is make sure we're dwelling in God's presence. That he says that ultimately, when we trust in Christ, realizing that we trust in him because of his broken body, he, and we believe in him, he has opened up the way that I can actually know that I am with God, that I am in the holy place with God, that I can hear God's voice, that God is wanting to speak with me, to lead me, to direct me. And so this faith and trust puts us in that place of holiness. See, when we dwell, when we realize we've been invited into the dwelling of God, that should bring us to a place of genuine humility. Where I'm just, I, I enter in humbly because I realize God has invited me into this place. God wants to meet with me. God wants to converse with me. God wants to love on me. Isn't that awesome? He's invited us into the most holy of place. Jesus made it accessible that we didn't have to wait on somebody else to get us into God's presence. We've been invited in ourselves. And so when we have that sincere heart that just wants to seek God, that wants to be with God above all else, and we surrender ourselves fully, say, Lord, I am totally yours. Lord, I'm coming into this space and I'm laying aside all of what I want to accomplish and what I want to have done. And Lord, I want what your will be done in my life what you want to do in and through me. God, I am yours, sold out, just like Christ was sold out to his heavenly Father. May we be sold out in the same way. That daily I'm coming to that place, say, Lord, I'm coming into your presence. I'm just laying myself down, and I want to be wholly yours. That we're letting God speak to us. That we're surrendered to what is God's way, God's direction, God's heart. It's not that I'm thinking about what everybody else should be doing. But am I truly living in that position, that surrendered place unto Christ? And that really is the first idea we need to keep in our minds, is that am I staying in that place of just dwelling in the presence of God? I'm loving on God and letting God love on me. Now that's kind of the me and Jesus piece. And, and we, a lot of times in Christianity, can get good at that. But it's the second piece that the writer of Hebrews pulls to staying on course that I think is a challenge to us, that it says... Do not let us forsake meeting together to spur one another on. The second component is there's this piece of God has called us into a body to work together. That we're pressing into this presence together to want to deal with Christ together, to follow God together, to be God's holy people. Now, I don't understand why, but in the world and in our human spirit, there's just this natural tendency in us that rises up that we end up wanting to divide the body, don't we? We find ourselves on this side or that side. And, and there's this continual tension. And the church is, is not immune from that in any way. We find ourselves in the same place oftentimes. That's why it's so important that as churches that we think about our leadership, that we hope that they're mature people that are really seeking into the presence of God and wanting God's presence to be dwelt, God's will to be accomplished above any personal thing that may be going on. But this really, this working together really requires us to stay on course, requires us to set aside our own ego, our own politics, our own opinion, our own personal interest. That's kind of hard for us to do. You know, it's so interesting to us as we see how God seems to allow different opinions to exist. One of the mysteries I've found as I've been in pastoral leadership and now as a district superintendent for almost six years is I get to work with a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives, a lot of people that call themselves followers of Christ. And I have to honestly say, I have met people that truly love Jesus and are trying to follow Jesus faithfully that are on this side 
and on this side of a variety of issues. Some of those I may personally agree with, some I may not. But what I find is I cannot debate that they really do love Jesus and are trying to walk and live in the presence. And people on the other side are in the same position. And, and so it can become somewhat confusing. And we very easily can start to demonize and say, well then, how are we supposed to do this together? But you know, one of the things I find about Jesus that's amazing to me, you know, and, and what's written in Hebrews, it says, you know, as the church was struggling, they said, don't you separate over here and you separate over here. It's instead, how do we work together to make this work? And I, I think it's interesting if you go back and look at the early church and you find one of the big battles they were running up against was the whole is, issue of circumcision. We don't battle over that in our culture today, but in Jewish culture, that was a big deal. You back back to the patriarchs of the Old Testament and you find that it was commanded that, you know, male children, if you're going to be a good Jewish boy that follows God, you need to be circumcised. And if you're not, then you really can't be a follower. And in the early church, we find that same thing started to happen, that for people who were not circumcised, and they started saying they were following Jesus, they said, well, you need to be if you're really going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit fell on people that weren't circumcised, and they went, what do we do with that? God seems to be working here in places that shouldn't be working. And so all of a sudden, it's like, how are we going to work together now in the midst of this kind of struggle? And in our time of disruption, it's so easy to try to camp ourselves, but we need to figure out how we work together because one of the things Jesus said in John chapter 17, it's powerful. He said, how the world is going to know me is when they see how well you love one another. And so that's hard for us, isn't it? Because we, we want self to rise up, but instead it's more about dwelling in the presence, even sometimes when we may find ourselves in different places. And that really requires a trust of one another that we trust each person is trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes maybe God allows us to remain dissident. And maybe that reason he allows it is for some reason to keep us humble. That we realize that we each are trying and we don't have it all completely figured out. That's hard. Nothing about this is easy. But staying on course means dwelling in the presence and realizing God has called us to do it together to spur one another on. And that means together we're listening with one ear to the Holy Spirit while we're also listening to the reality of the world in which we find ourselves. And so we're really trying to stay in tune. And as we're listening, we're listening for where's the sense of peace right now in this conversation? Where does it feel right? Where does it feel whole? When do I feel freedom? Or on the other hand, maybe we're finding ourselves in those moments saying, when is my own agenda rising up? Is my own opinion right now rising up? Or am I really saying, God, I really want to live surrendered here and let you be there? I think when we are living well together, what we find is there's some guiding principles in our Wesleyan heritage. Our bishop has also been laying these out before us, and I think these are huge in this work of working together in this to stay on course in these times and I think these four guiding principles can be very helpful for us the first I think we always have to ask first as we're dwelling with Christ dwelling in God's presence is this is are we together growing in love towards God and with one another does that mean that when we are together we can really see that we both are trying to we're trying to go deep into knowing God better loving on God, living in that lordship place where God is truly Lord of our lives? And as we're listening to that, also, am I growing and loving those who I may struggle with? Do I love my neighbor? Do I forgive those who offend me? Am I doing that work well? We should be together spurring one another on helping each other love God more fully. Even sometimes in the disruption, and the differences. I think also then it moves us on to proclaiming Christ. You know, one of the things I've heard so often in our churches is we're focused on helping people come to Jesus. But the question is, has anybody come to Jesus lately? I've been excited to read some of the reports of our local churches and see how they're talking about people that are coming to profess faith, even though they may be vir worshiping virtually. That's exciting. But sometimes we also are talking about how important it is for people to come to faith and we have nobody coming to faith and then we have to question, well, why not? 
Is God not finding us faithful enough to entrust us with people? Because if we look at the early church, one of the symbols and signs was daily he was adding to their number. And folks, if we're living faithfully, that I believe should be part of how our lives are lived out. I was recently uh, reading a story from one of the mission organizations my wife and I um, sponsor, and it was really encouraging as during this COVID season, as they've had to shift up how they're doing things and they've been out delivering meals, people that they've been delivering to have said, why do you do this? And they said, well, we do it because Jesus loves you and, and wants to walk with you and we love you too. And they said, man, we would like to know this Jesus. And so people have come to faith and been baptized because of the witness that has been happening. Also, we find that it we're called to serve one another and that means who's God putting across our path that needs healing, that needs acts of mercy, that needs somebody to respond to their situation in care and love. I think we do that fairly well. But together, who is God putting in our path that we need to care for and love on? And finally, seek justice. Who are the people that God has put around us whose backs are against the wall? Who are the people in our community that they don't have anybody standing in their court? Nobody's standing up for them, or they feel all alone. Who are the oppressed, the poor, the abused, the mentally ill, the immigrant? Who are the people that are out there that need somebody to stand up with them and say, hey, I'm here for you to help take your case out into the light, to stand for you so things might be better for you? I think those are all things that it means to dwell in the presence of Christ together and what it means as we work together to build God's continual kingdom. Folks, I find that though we're in this season of disruption, this time when it can be easy for us to not sure which way we should be directing ourselves, I think it could be a time when God is trying to get our attention to make sure that we're really focused on Christ first and that we're really willing to say we all bring a piece to this And how are we all directing our eyes towards Christ together? So many times in our local churches, it's easy for us just to get together and we have a devotion and a prayer and then we start decision making. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're discerning the will and direction of God. That may be our human effort. Instead, we need to really be sensing, Lord, where are you wanting us to go? What are you wanting us to do? It's not about what we want to see happen. It's about what you want to see happen And how do we unite our hearts together to lay down our own agendas to say, God, together, we want to figure out how to move in this way in a way that lets people see how they love one another and how we're spurring one another on to a deeper relationship with God. Folks, these are times that we might quickly want to um, hope that this disruption moves on so we can get back to life as usual. But folks... May we be in this position where we're saying, Lord God, right now, I'm trying to tune my ears to hear you. We're hearing, trying to tune in together. Direct us that when we come out on the other side of this, Lord, we're in step with following right where you want us to be following, going where you want us to go for your glory and honor. A lot of this isn't cut and dry and easy. It takes a lot of pressing in, but it also takes a lot of listening And sensing where is the Holy Spirit moving and at work. And making sure that self isn't rising up. Self is staying submitted to lordship. And love is remaining evident in how we're responding to one another. Folks, as we move continually through this time for however long it will last. May we take to heart the words of Hebrews. And may our lives so reflect the gospel that we can say tomorrow that we have truly grown in our love for Christ and we have truly gathering together to help one another press on together to glorify and honor God that others may know His love and grace as well. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank You so much for Your Word. I thank You so much, God, that even in times of disruption, You remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we realize we live in times that are very divided. And God, in the midst of that, we're trying to figure it out. And Lord, so often it's easy for self to rise up. 
It's so easy to demonize the other. Lord, instead, help us to be able to see your light at work in those who claim your name. And Lord, may our hearts come as one together to press into you first and above all things and to learn how we may live together even in our dissidents in a way that can bring you glory and honor. God, may we be faithful to staying the course and may you receive all the glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Betty. This truly is our Father's world, and we are so glad that we have, uh, we have an opportunity to be a part of that. You know, we are all stewards of all the things that God has created, and uh, one of those things is our ability to give back a portion of that which we have received. We do continue to take offering, even though we are in our homes and uh, We're sequestered away from the the church and the ability to gather. You do have a number of ways to to continue uh, offering to the Lord that which he has given to you. Uh, You can mail in your offerings. There's opportunity to do that online as well. So please take advantage of those uh, opportunities to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. And now would you close with us in singing Cornerstone.
Hear now this benediction. Father God, we leave here this day worshiping you with a thankful heart, with a song of praise. With an outstretched arm, Lord, we bless your name. Go with us into this world with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.